Good morning. Great to see you guys. My name is Luke. I'm one of the pastors here and really uh, happy to welcome you this morning. Uh, we've had some big developments as a church related to our building next door, our campus next door, and this is kind of going to set up our time together. Really cool stuff is that actually a couple days before Easter, we got the certificate of occupancy, which means they uh, pass final inspection and we're in the building and we're now in the process of kind of starting to move things over. So that's pretty cool. Uh, you can clap for that. If, yeah, that's pretty great. If, if you're like, what are you talking about? Well, here's what I'm talking about. There's a building directly west of this, this whole property. As you go out, if you're new with us and you didn't know about this, uh, that's our property, uh, which we now have the certificate of occupancy for, and it's really, really fun. And so the building is basically finished in terms of construction. There's a few, more than a few, like a few thousand little uh, like punch list, you know, nitty bitty kinds of things that have to be done. Lots of tech that has to be installed, lots of furniture that's gonna be moving. So you'll notice over the next month, Certain things just kind of start to disappear, and that's because they're going next door. We'll still have chairs for you, I promise. You, you won't have to bring your, uh, you know, camping chairs or anything. We'll have chairs for you. Um, but, but really, really cool. And actually, if you go out and you look at it today, over the weekend, they laid down sod, which means the whole back part of the property now has grass, which you are not allowed to play on or be on for the next three weeks. All right, everybody? It just went in, but it looks spectacular, and it's just really, really cool how that has all come along. We actually moved our staff offices over there this week, and uh, we're getting really close. So here's basically the deal. That means we've got five more Sundays in this building until we move over there and just continue to have services there uh, from then on. So we'll have a soft opening over in that space on June 2nd, a soft opening on June 2nd. We'll hang out, we'll be in that space, we'll figure out a lot of kinks and try to work through stuff, and then at the end of the summer, back to school time, we'll do a grand opening on July 28th. And so that's pretty dang cool. Can you believe it? I mean, that's awesome. So here's the only thing... Here's the only thing I'd ask you is if you have, uh, if you have friends uh, that you've been planning to invite when it comes to the new building, you need to know June 2nd is going to be a disaster. It's going to be a zoo. No one's going to know where to park. No one's going to know where the bathrooms are. No one's going to know how to check kids in. Uh, right? You all have your kind of assigned seats. <laughs> Anderson's, right? I got to look around. I know you, you all, Gilmore's, you're out of position. <laughs> You guys are normally back there where the Tennysons are, but the Buchholzes, you're in your spot, right? Everyone's got their spot, and, and you're not going to have a spot, and it's going to be confusing. And so if you have friends you've been waiting to invite, please invite them not on June 2nd, okay? <laughs> Wait a few weeks, let us work some kinks out, and that way it'll just be a better experience for everybody. But uh, this is going to be fun. So this last series that we're really doing in this building is actually the perfect series for this moment in our church's history, and that's this study of the book of Jonah. We're going to spend the next four weeks looking at Jonah, and this is perfect because our kind of long-term vision and heart's desire for our church is to be the best friend that our community has. That's what we want to be. We want to be the best friend that this community has. Not because we're special, but because we believe Jesus is. And so what we've done is spent the last uh, few months before Easter just looking at Jesus. Who was he as a person? How did he love with the desire that we would begin to love and imitate him uh, in, the, in the way that he loved and in the way that he lived? And so now what we're going to do in these next few weeks is, is begin to look at kind of what, are, what is God's heart? What are God's eyes for the community around us? We're going to be moving from being a large church to a very large church. There are going to be hundreds of people, maybe five, six, seven hundred people over the next six months, maybe more, who don't currently come here, who don't know the story of our church, who don't know the story of the Bible, who don't know Jesus. What's our heart to them? Because here's the thing, they're going to take your seat. Right? It won't be long. You think you marked out your territory. Nope, they're in your seat. And they are in your parking spot. And everything's more inconvenient and everything's more complex. And this, you, you know, you thought, oh, we're getting this thing and it'll all be nice and roomy. Nope, it's going to fill right up. So the question is will we embrace it? Will we embrace it? Because here's what I know the only people who like really large churches are pastors. Right? Pastors and worship leaders like leading to a big full room. Everyone else, it's just a hassle. 
But will we have God's heart? Will we see our community, especially the people who are far from God? Will we see them the way that God does? That's what the book of Jonah invites us to do. Uh, let me give you just an overview of Jonah. It's one of the minor prophets, uh, not because it's minor in importance, but just because it's short. Uh, you actually, if you had a hard time finding it, don't worry. It's right between Obadiah and Micah. It's just right there in that crunchy part of your Bible. Um, it's actually just on these two pages, right? So it's really short, really easy to miss. It's actually 40, it's only 48 verses. So it's a really short book, which is why we're only doing four weeks on it. Uh, and it's unique in some ways. Most of the prophetic books are words of a prophet. You know, Isaiah's words, Ezekiel's words, Jeremiah's words. This is not the words of Jonah, but rather a story about Jonah. So rather than the words of Jonah, there aren't many of them, actually. It's mostly what he did. And the other way that this book is unique is that it records a missionary kind of prophet. Most of the prophets, their job was to call the people of Israel to repentance. Their job was to say, hey, Israel, we love God, and you're not living like it, so let's get our act together. It's kind of a more internal message. But this prophet is actually called to go to a foreign country, to a foreign place, And not just any place, but a place that the Jews hated. I'm going to give you some background here on Nineveh, where Jonah goes to, and on Jonah. Nineveh was the capital city. It's called a great city in the book of Jonah. The capital city of a nation known as Assyria. Assyria at this time was a brutal, brutal regime. Vicious, horrific Listen to what one commentator, how they describe Assyria during this time. Assyria was one of the cruelest and most violent empires of ancient times. Their history is as gory and blood-curdling a history as we know. Assyrian emperors were well known for depicting torture. I'm going to tell you, this is intense, okay? But you actually need to feel this in order to understand the story. Their emperors were well known for depicting torture, dismembering, and decapitations of enemies in grisly detail on large stone panels. After capturing enemies, the Assyrians would typically cut off their legs and one arm, leaving the other arm and hand so they could shake the victim's hand in mockery as he was dying. They forced friends and family members to parade with the decapitated heads of their loved ones elevated on poles. They pulled out prisoners' tongues and stretched their bodies with ropes so they could be flayed alive and their skins displayed on city walls. They burned adolescents alive. Sorry, ladies. Your adolescents, they would have burned you alive. Those who survived the destruction of their cities were fated to endure cruel and violent forms of slavery. They're basically a terrorist state. ISIS. This is the right, Islamic State kind of stuff that you saw, especially a few years ago. You just saw the horrific ways. That, that was Nineveh. And so Jonah is sent to Nineveh. Now here's what's interesting that you've got to know about Jonah. Jonah was known as the patriotic prophet because In 2 Kings 14, there was a king, Jeroboam II, who had really been advancing Israel's borders through warfare. And while some of the other prophets spoke against it, Jonah was in full support of it. He was kind of nationalistic, patriotic. He was all into Israel kind of establishing itself as strong in the region and in the world. So get the irony here. God tells the most Jewish prophet to go to the people that the Jews most hated. So here's the structure of how this book then shakes out. You see there's a kind of parallel dynamic in it where chapter 1 and chapter 3 are similar and chapter 2 and chapter 4 are similar. Here's the structure if you just kind of want to take a look at this. In chapter 1 and chapter 3, it's Jonah's encounters with different people. In chapter 1, it's Jonah encountering these sailors, these pagan, non-Jewish uh, sailors and, and how he interacts with them. In chapter 3, it's Jonah encountering these pagan Ninevites. And then his prayers, if you want to call them that, are in chapters 2 and chapter 4. In chapter 2, it's a prayer of repentance, kind of. And in chapter 4, it's mostly 
him griping because God has actually had mercy on these Ninevites. Jonah's famous for the fish. Did you read about the fish in Jonah chapter 1, verse 17? The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. A lot of people get distracted by that and miss the rest of the book. It's famous for that, and if you go, man, I have a hard time believing that. How could a fish swallow a guy? I'll tell you what, that is hard to believe. I'm not discounting that at all. That's pretty hard to believe. And I'll tell you what's even harder to believe is that a guy predicted his death and resurrection and then did it. So for us who are followers of Jesus, this is actually not that hard to believe because we just celebrated Easter (laughs) where Jesus died and rose again. So that's kind of an overview of the book. Today we're going to focus on chapter one. And chapter one is going to give us three case studies of rebellion, identity, and faith. We're going to be able to look at these three different sections of chapter one and see a case study of rebellion, a case study of identity, and a case study of faith. So that's where we're going to go today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. God, make us attentive to it. Give us a desire to hear what you have to say, to reflect on it, and to apply it. God, in all of it, help us to see the beauty of Jesus through it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So three different case studies that we see in Jonah chapter 1. The first is a case study on rebellion. A case study on rebellion. Rebellion is another word to describe sin. This reality that all of us have rejected God, are ignoring God, and are disobeying God. And in Jonah chapter 1, we see a vivid HD case study on sin. Look at what it says in chapter 1 verse 1. It says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. A couple of things that we just need to pause on first is in verse 1, notice how it says LORD, all caps. Do you see that in your Bible? Anytime you see, especially in the Old Testament, where it says LORD and it's all caps, that is referring to the Hebrew name for God, Yahweh. The whole idea that people in the ancient Near East had was that there were these kind of tribal, local deities. There was Baal, and there was Asherah, and there were all these different gods. Well, Israel's God, who claimed to be not just the God of Israel, but the God of heaven and earth, his name is Yahweh. So anytime you see it, all caps, it's saying, now the word of Yahweh came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying this. And you see that he's called to go to Nineveh to call out against it. Now you'd think, oh man, Jonah's going to be stoked about this because he hates Nineveh. What would be better than a guy who hates Nineveh showing up and going, y'all going to burn. Y'all going to burn. Well, here's the reason why he wasn't happy about it is because he knows God doesn't just warn people for no reason. He warns people so they'll turn, so they'll repent, so they'll change. So God will forgive and have mercy on them. And so in light of that, look at Jonah's response, verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. And this gives us our first lesson about rebellion, is that sin is saying no to what God wants. Sin simply is saying no to what God wants. God says go, Jonah says no, right? There's your summary of chapter one. God says go, Jonah says no. In fact, he goes in the far opposite direction. Let me show you a map of this. This is pretty interesting. So uh, this would have all taken place kind of north of where Joppa is on this map. That's where Jonah would have been. And God says, hey, go to Nineveh, which is northeast, And so Jonah says, you know what? How about I go to Tarshish? (laughs) Far west. That was probably, most scholars estimate, that was probably what Hebrews could conceive of, what Jews could conceive of as like the furthest place away. So he goes, I'm going to Joppa, I'm getting on a boat, and I'm headed to Tarshish, right? This is like God tells you to go to San Diego, and you say, I'll be in Miami, right? Absolute opposite direction. Sin is saying no to what God wants. 
Jonah goes, no, 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 I'm not doing this. God has it all wrong. God's going to show mercy to these people. That's not what they need. They need wrath. They need judgment. They need condemnation. I'm not going to go there. What is God thinking? Any of you have uh, children who are smarter than you? (laughs) If you're not sure, just ask them. (laughs) They'd be happy to tell you. I can't tell you how smart I was when I was a teenager. I just was absolutely brilliant. I had every answer. And I often knew, yeah, my parents, gosh, my old man, yeah, he means well, but what an idiot, right? That's how I thought. (laughs) And that's what sin is. Yeah, 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 God says that, but that that, that isn't going to make me happy. God wouldn't want me to be unhappy. Clearly, this would be a better plan. What, What does God know? That's what sin is. Sin is saying no to what God wants. Here's the second thing this passage tells us is that sin will take you down. Sin will take you down. Notice the repetition of the word down in verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. What's the author trying to communicate? That when you try to get away from God, you're going down. Here's what Charlie Dates says about this. He says, life has but one direction when you're running from God, down. Are you running from God? Are you ignoring what God says? Is God saying, hey, you need to do this and you're not doing it? Hey, you need to stop that, but you're continuing it? You're going down. It does not lead to life. It does not lead to blessing. It does not lead to joy. It does not lead to your overall flourishing. It is leading you down. Here's the third thing these verses tell us about sin and rebellion is that sin imagines you can flee God's presence. Notice how that, verse, how that phrase is repeated in verse 3. Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He paid the fare, he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Look down to verse 10. The men were exceedingly afraid, said to him, what is this you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. This is a kind of practical atheism. This is when someone who says, oh, I believe in God, actually functions as though there's no God at all. I don't know if you've ever uh, heard about this or, or learned this, but do you know how uh, Google Maps keeps track of traffic on your phone? Do you, know, do you know how they do this? I mean, this is an amazing Isn't it a beautiful technology that you can just pull this thing up and you can see, oh, there's a traffic jam here because it's all red. Oh, no, it's a little bit, it's yellow. Oh, it's clear sailing, it's green, right? Have you ever noticed that? Maybe you've had a time when you like have put in a destination and it's navigating you and it says, we found a faster route. Would you like to accept it? Yes, I would, right? Boom. How did it know that? How does it know the red and the yellow and the green? How does it know that? You know how it knows it? is because your phone is constantly sending anonymous data to Google that's telling Google how fast you're moving in your car. And all the other phones on the highway are doing that same thing. Now, the good news is, it's all anonymous data, you hope, (laughs) right? But doesn't that just kind of creep you out a little bit? Like, isn't all the privacy tech stuff just make you nervous? Like, what, who are they tracking? And, and is this camera really on? And, and is Alexa hearing me? And, you know, right? Doesn't that stuff make you nervous? Here's what should make you really nervous. God sees and hears everything. And it's not anonymous. <laughs> he knows every action. He knows every word. He knows every thought. He knows every motive. Where can you go from his presence? You can't get away from it. 
And so this is folly. This is stupid. But this is what sin does. Well, I'll get away. God won't see this. God won't notice that. If I keep the lights dim and the door closed and the sound down, God won't notice. No, maybe your wife won't, but God will. You cannot flee the presence of God. Look then at verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. The literal translation of that, the ship is being personified there in the Hebrew language. You could translate this as the ship expected itself to crack up. Or the ship was about to become a nervous wreck. Isn't that a cool wordplay? The ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid and each cried out to his God. These are guys from different parts of the world, different nationalities, different ethnicities, and each kind of local place had their own gods. They're each calling out in prayer. We got to do something. Notice that it says the mariners were afraid. These are professional sailors. These are professional cargo guys. What does it take for them to have a storm so sudden and so severe that they're now afraid? This is big. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? (laughs) What are you doing? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Hey, man, we need everybody in on this. There's some God is mad at us, so cover the bases. Wake up. What do we learn From this about rebellion and sin, we learn that sin always has collateral damage. You think your sin is between you and God, but it's not. Look, these these sailors didn't ask to have their lives threatened, didn't ask to have to give up all this cargo, right? Sometimes you're in a world of hurt because of your own folly and sin, And sometimes you're in a world of hurt because of someone else's. We think, oh, the sin's just between me and God. And it's never between just you and God. It always has collateral damage. The way you relate to people, the way you love people, the way you look at people, the way you do or don't really listen to people, all of that is shaped by your secret and not secret world of sin. So here's the question. There's a question for each of these case studies to reflect on. Here's the question for this one. What is God commanding you to do that you are refusing? What's God commanding you to do that you're refusing? You know that God is maybe commanding you. You know what? This this consumer debt's out of hand. You've got to cut up those credit cards, but you haven't done it yet. And there's that one card your spouse doesn't know about that you keep spending on. And you know he's commanding you to stop it. But you're refusing. Maybe God's commanding you to stop living together before you're married. So you know what? You want to play married. You want to enjoy the fruits of of marriage. Get married. And until then, move out but you're refusing. You go, well, I, I know better than God. I, 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 we need it for money's sake. And, uh, and I just we want to make sure we're compatible. And, you know, we have a dog that we bought together. And how you're just refusing. Maybe you know that the images you're posting of yourself online and that you're sending to other people aren't appropriate. You know selfies are for faces, but you're sending more than that. And you're refusing. Maybe there's that relationship with that person who's not your spouse, and you just have revealed a little too much. And you know God's telling you, hey, be careful. There's danger here, and you're refusing. What is God commanding you to do, and you're refusing to do it? The longer you refuse, the further down you'll go and the more collateral damage that will be everywhere. You cannot flee the presence of the Lord. Repent. Acknowledge it. Turn. Ask for forgiveness. Get accountability. Get help. 
before God has to take you down. Second case study in this passage is a case study on identity. A case study on identity. These sailors are terrified. They've all been crying out to their own gods. Nothing is changing. It just seems to be getting worse. And so in verse 7, they have a new idea. Verse 7, and they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? Right? They ask him all these questions. Who are you? What's your identity? What are you about? What do you do for work? Where are you from? Where's your place? You know, I think, that, that all of us are kind of trying to live out of some identity. I'm a husband. I'm a Christian. I'm a CEO, I'm a teacher, I'm a mom, I'm a grandpa, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm a blank. That's your identity. That's what they're asking. Jonah, who are you? What's your identity? What's his answer? They asked him three specific questions. What's your occupation? What's your place? What's your people? Notice what he leads with. And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew. Jonah's fundamental identity, I'm a Hebrew. Not a prophet, not a child of God. I'm a Hebrew. He leads with his nationality. He leads with his patriotism. I'm the patriot prophet. I'm a Hebrew. Then he continues, and I fear Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. To which you want to ask, really? Really, Jonah? You fear Yahweh? Because we can't tell. You seem like you're doing what you want because your fundamental identity is not that you fear Yahweh, but that you are a Hebrew. And what God's asked you to do doesn't make sense if you're a Hebrew. And so you've jettisoned the identity of a fear of Yahweh, because you're a Hebrew. Well, this makes them even more afraid. Look at verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid. (laughs) You notice in verse 5, the mariners were afraid. Now they're exceedingly afraid. Why are they now exceedingly afraid? Well, because did you see how Jonah described Yahweh? The God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Whoa, 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 whoa. Ding, 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 ding. We found it. We found (laughs) it. We found the God who's mad at us. It's this one who made the sea and the dry land, not just a local deity, but a cosmic deity over all things. And they said to him, what is this that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. How's that for a witness? He told them, I'm trying to get away from God. I guess he's mad at me. Does that sound like a heart of repentance to you? Heart of sorrow over sin? A heart of, oh, how did I let it get this far? No, that is callous, hard, rebellious. And they hear that callousness and they are terrified. Here's the question this passage, this part raises. What is your primary and central identity? For Jonah, I'm a Hebrew, I'm a patriot. That was what he led with. Yeah, 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 and and I follow, I fear God. But he's clearly not living out of that identity. So the question for you is, what identity are you most living out of? What identity is most central for you, is primary for you? What identity is shaping you? Have you ever seen Christians where you go, man, they say that they love Jesus, but they're so greedy you, they say that they love Jesus, but they're so immodest. They say that they love Jesus, but they're so indifferent to racism. They say they love Jesus, but they're workaholics just like everybody else. They say they love Jesus, but they just seem so determined to crush their kids with their expectations. 
Do you know why that happened? Because even though we say we're Christians, that happens when our fundamental identity is something else. When our fundamental identity is I'm going to be a parent who does it right. And that's what comes out, no matter what we say about our faith. When our fundamental identity is I'm a conservative, then that's what comes out, no matter what it says about our faith. When our fundamental identity is I need to be beautiful, I need people to like my appearance, then that's what comes out, regardless of what we say about our faith. What's your identity? Are you living out of an identity that says, I need to achieve, I need to be comfortable, I need to be seen a certain way, I need to have my beliefs honored and esteemed, or are you living out of the reality that you fear the Lord who made heaven and earth His delight in you is all you need and you don't have to prove it or earn it or get it because it's already been given to you in Christ. What's your identity? Here's a third case study that we see in this passage is a case study on faith. Faith. Verse 11, then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? Right? This is the way they're thinking. Like, well... I guess it's your fault, so what do we, what, and you're clearly not going to repent about this. You're clearly not going to apologize. We've been all praying, and you're not, so what do you suggest here? He said to them, verse 12, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it's because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Here's a question. Is Jonah's offer, hey, sacrifice me, is that noble or is it selfish? What do you think? Commentators go back and forth on this, right? Because some people read this and go, oh, wow, look at Jonah. He knew that like, these guys were all in danger, and so he sacrificed himself for the good of others. Other people read it and go, you know what? This is the most selfish thing he did because now he's going, not going to get to Nineveh now. Hey, okay, God, good luck getting me to Nineveh. I'm overboard. Well, God speaks and fish show up. So (laughs) he couldn't stop it. But but we don't know. We don't know. What was his motive? We don't know exactly. But he says, throw me overboard. And yet that's a serious thing. These guys are going, I don't want this guy's blood on my hands. And so you'd think they'd be like, freaking get over here. (laughs) One, two, three. Woo. Oh, get rid of that guy. But they're more noble than he is. Right, so look at verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. They're going, we're not throwing this guy over. Let's just try to get to shore. And they can't get it, and it gets harder, and it gets more dangerous, and God is clearly more and more angry. So therefore, verse 14, they called out to Yahweh. So now these guys, who had all been calling out to their own local tribal deities, are now calling out to Israel's God, to Yahweh. Oh, Yahweh. Let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O Yahweh, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Right, remember they had feared, then they feared exceedingly. Now they fear Yahweh exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows. This is a fascinating case study on faith. There's lots of contrasts in this whole passage, in this whole chapter between Jonah and the sailors. Jonah's asleep through all the danger. The sailors are extremely alert. Jonah's absorbed by his own problems and disappointment. The sailors are seeking the good of everyone in the boat. Hey, everybody, get on board. Let's, Let's call out to God. Jonah doesn't pray at all. Sailors keep praying to all their own gods, but here's the biggest contrast. The biggest contrast is faith. Jonah claims to fear God, but he doesn't pray, and he doesn't obey, he doesn't say, I'm sorry. On the other hand, these sailors who don't know God at all pray and call out to God and exceedingly fear God. Not just in the middle of the storm, but after the storm has passed. See, there's a lot of people who are like Jonah. 
They, they only call out to God when it's bad or they just don't call out to God at all. But the sailors, they call out to God when it's bad and when it's good. So here's the question. Is your faith more like Jonah's or the sailors? Is your faith more like Jonah's or the sailors? Are you ignoring God? Is God ratcheting up pressure in your life? He's turning up the storm in your life and you will not admit it and you will not repent and you will not turn. You will just harden your heart and you will keep getting through it. Or will you maybe even say, all right, God, fine enough. Rescue me, rescue me, rescue me. But then as soon as he rescues you, you're done calling out to him. Or are you like these sailors? who maybe you don't know all the stuff and you don't have all the answers, but you call out to God when it's bad and you call out to God when you're fine. That's a picture of faith, right? Have you ever heard of a foxhole conversion or a jailhouse conversion, right? You hear about this, people who go to prison and right after they get in prison, all of a sudden their life has changed and they're a Christian and, and, and you kind of always wonder like, man, was that real or was it just the pressure that got to them and they, now they're a Christian? This, that's not what these guys have. What, do you notice it in verse 16? After the sea ceased from its raging, then the men feared their Lord exceedingly. They make a sacrifice. They make vows. Where's your faith? So here's the last sort of question. What if you find yourself stuck in rebellion where you're refusing to do what God has asked you to do? What if you find yourself with an identity that's more central and primary to you than him? And what if you find yourself with a faith that's more like Jonah's? Where God is occasionally useful to you, but he's never really beautiful. You only cry out when you need something. What if you find yourself in those three places? Here's what I want to encourage you this morning. If you find yourself in those places then the answer is not to try harder. The answer is not to do better. The answer is to look to the one to whom Jonah points. Because when Jesus reflected on the story of Jonah, here's what he said. He said, someone greater than Jonah is here. And he was referring to himself. So you look to Jesus. You don't look at yourself. You don't look to your self-determination. You don't look to your ability to, I'm gonna just change my behavior. You look to Jesus. Jesus is the greater Jonah. Maybe Jonah selfishly sacrificed himself, but Jesus selflessly did it. Not just to storm, to, to, to calm the storm of circumstances, but to calm the storm of sin so that God could be enough for you. Listen, look to Jesus. Jesus is the one who forgives you for your rebellion, who washes you clean, who brings you into his family, who even though you sinned against him, he welcomes you in and makes you his child. Jesus is the one who gives you an identity that you do not have to work for. Think about this. Every identity that we're pursuing, you have to achieve it, right? If your identity is, I need to be beautiful, there aren't enough burpees, and Botox in the world to defeat gravity and time. But you will work it and work it and work it and do it and do it and do it and you will do everything that you can do and it will exhaust you. If your identity is your work, that you're successful and you can achieve stuff and you're, you make it happen, then you're gonna have to constantly do that. Great, last quarter was good, but what about this quarter? Last year was great, but what about this year. If your identity is that you're a good person because you believe the right political things, you're going to always have to show that you're more progressive than everyone else, more conservative than everyone else. You're going to always have to, to prove it. But what if you could have an identity that you couldn't and didn't have to achieve, but that was just given to you? Look to Jesus. And find in him an identity where you are saved not by your effort and not by your performance, but by his grace. And look to Jesus. 
the one who gives you a faith that shows that he is beautiful and worthy of your worship and worthy of your prayer and worthy of your life, not just when you're in the foxhole and you need it, but when everything is great and you worship and you praise him because he is the most beautiful person ever. Someone greater than Jonah is here. Look to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace to us. God, we're like the Ninevites who don't know our right hands from our left, whose sin has separated us from you. And God, we're also like Jonah. We often know what we're supposed to do and we refuse to do it. We think we know better. We think we're going up, 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 but instead we're going down, down, down. And so God, wake us up, forgive us, God, help us have a heart of compassion on those who are far from you and those who are currently your enemies. God, thank you that even when we don't and even when we totally screw it up, that you still accomplish your purposes and save your people. God, help us be faithful in this next season as we prepare to witness to the beauty of Jesus in this community. We pray it in Christ's name, amen.